So I'm Mary Cerruti, and I am the director and chief curator here at Sculpture Center. Um, I also happen to be the curator of this particular exhibition, um, which uh, started its journey um, two and a half years ago now, um, when uh, Katrin Sugadardator was invited to represent Iceland at the 55th Venice Biennale. Um, and the way Iceland's process works is that they um, select the artists that they most want to have represent their country in that um, context, and then the artist goes about putting together their team, and the work um, or the the exhibition and the project is commissioned by the Icelandic Art Center, which is a um, an organization based in Reykjavik that does international programming for the Icelandic arts community um, and supporting work going out into the world from Iceland as well as international projects in Iceland, um, and so uh, Katrin asked uh, me and. Uh, fellow curator, Alaria Brancoso, who is um, now the director at the Villa Croce in uh, Genoa, Italy, who Katrin had worked with in um, twice, on two prior occasions. Um, Katrin and I at that time had never worked together, so it was a real treat to um, embark on this project with her at that point. And so from that moment, um, she, you know, it was from her thinking about this project, to executing the project, to realizing it first in Venice, then in Reykjavik, and now here at Sculpture Center. Um, so I I don't want to spend a lot of time introducing the work itself as much as, because we're going to talk about the work, and I want Katrin to talk about the work, and Danielle, who has her own um, perspectives on the work, um, and on Katrin's practice in general. Um, so I'll start by introducing um, both Katrin and Danielle. Um, so, uh, Danielle Kusluk Grosshelde, did I say that right? Okay. Um, uh, joined the curatorial staff at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, in the Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts uh, in 1984. So she's responsible for the collections of French and English furniture and period interiors. Um, and she's written extensively on European decorative arts um, she was the co-author of European Furniture in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Highlights of the Collection, as well as a handbook to the Reitzman Galleries for French Decorative Arts. Uh, she was most recently the co-curator of an exhibition at the Bar Graduate Center in New York entitled Salvaging the Past, George Henschel and French Decorative Arts from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And she was responsible for the installation of a new gallery devoted to Dutch decorative arts, which opened to the public in May of 2013. She's currently preparing an exhibition about visitors for, to Versailles for 2017. Um, so we're very pleased to have Danielle with us. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge Anne Strauss, who um, was the curator of contemporary art at the Met, curator of contemporary and modern art at the Met, um, and was the person who invited Katrin to do an exhibition at the Met um, in 2010, and um, was the curator on that exhibition. Um, I should say that I think when once Katrin was invited to do the show at the Met, she um, got to know Danielle because she had this interest in the period rooms there. And we'll talk about that piece a little bit more because I think that is a very, very important precursor to this um, project now. So Katrin, uh, Circa Dardator, for over two decades has explored the way physical structures and boundaries define our perception of space and reality. Um, she uses, she has sort of a playful use of scale and um, uses sort of a personal, personal memory and uh, a biographical relationship to architecture often, um, as well as to landscape, to create installations that um, give us a, a sh always a shifting perspective, both in terms of our bodies and relationship to architecture, as well as our, um, our memory of the spaces that we occupy. Um, she's had solo exhibitions, uh, as I mentioned, at the 55th Venice Biennale, which included this piece that traveled to the Reykjavik Art Museum before coming here. Um, her exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum I mentioned. She had a 2006 solo project at MoMA PS1. Um, as well as exhibitions um, throughout Europe and other parts of the world um, over the last 20 years. She has upcoming projects at um, 
at the MIT List Visual Arts Center in Boston in 2015, as well as Mass MoCA, and a project at the Parasol Unit Foundation for Contemporary Art in London, also coming up in 2015. So she's got, she's done an, um, she's had an amazing couple of years and is about to have another incredible few years. Um, so I think we should start our conversation um, by asking Katrin to sell, tell us a little bit about how you came to this project, um, uh, specifically sort of how through your work you came to this project and perhaps maybe using, I mean, we, I know, and I think many people already know that that project at the Met was really um, sort of a, a prologue to this piece in a way. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah, a prologue, or perhaps this is an epilogue. Or an to, epilogue, <laughs> exactly. I don't mean to. To, <laughs> to, uh, to the. To a that companion. Show. A companion, or, uh, yeah, we'll see. The future will really tell about, uh, about that. But anyway, um, um, in the exhibition that I did at the Metropolitan Museum that um, Anne Strauss invited me to do, and uh, where I met Danielle. Um, and we collaborated. And physical interaction of the viewer with the work on display. Um, I got um, sort of out of this process uh, um, many, many ideas, and many of them turned out somehow evolved around the period rooms. Um, this was probably, there was no coincidence to this, as as you mentioned, Mary, that there's often, you know, this element of, you know, this, <clears throat> um, my work often is looking at architecture and uh, somehow uh, f uh, f uh, suffusing um, imagination and memory with, you know, uh, the physical manifestation of structure and space. Uh, and, um, so the two works that I um, ended up uh, making uh, for the Metropolitan Museum were based on two French period rooms, both from the 18th century. And uh, that work was titled Boiserie, or Boiserie, yeah, Boiserie in, in plural, and each of the works were also titled Boiserie, so they were sort of twin titles of, of these sort of twin works. And uh, they focused um, specifically on the um, on the decorative paneling, which in French bears the name boiserie. And uh, and this uh, this paneling as a you know as sort of a decorative skin that is uh, that has been removed from the buildings where it was originally commissioned, and then is reinstalled in a museum and um, sort of carries the experience and the history of the places uh, where they were originally. And then also something new happens and something new is composed in the, in the museum, um, you know, within the, uh, within the, within the museum. And uh, so these were, uh, you could say, these were upright surfaces, these were vertical surfaces. And there was a moment when I realized I sort of, I can almost say that I a little bit ran out of energy and time when it came to the flooring. And so, you know, as is, as is often the case, then, you know, then that, so the end of the previous work almost becomes like a prompt for the new work or for the next work. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously not um, a floor that belongs to the, to the pieces that I did at the, at the Met, but in some way they, they are connected, I think. Um, the process of the making of this floor was um, also in some ways, I think, began in the, you know, began at the Met when I went and visited uh, Danielle and uh, told her about an idea that I had and, and she gave me some very good advice on where to look and how to begin my sort of inquiry and study of decorative floors. And then I spent uh, several uh, weeks visiting the library at the Met and uh, basically surveying every book that I could find that had any uh, imagery of decorative floors. And uh, at a certain point, sometimes I would, you know, I would come in day after day and uh, having having browsed through the 
through the whole things uh, at the website, and then I would check out 20 books day after day, and the librarian would ask, are you actually reading all of these books? <laughs> Which, of course, was, I, was, I was just sort of scanning through them and uh, looking, looking for images. And, um, and at the same time, I was making visits to Venice um, to look for the site that I could use to kind of bring together this idea of this uh, sort of disembodied floor that I wanted to make and, uh, and where to find the right site for that in, in, in Venice. And, uh, and little by little, I think, as I was sort of honing in on a certain location, the work was also forming. So the two, it was not like I sort of started with an idea of a floor that was of this shape with this type of pattern and then found a place for it in Venice because the outline of the floor is um, supposed to represent um, an 18th century pavilion. Um, and that's a little bit in relation to the uh, uh, to the fact that Iceland doesn't have its own pavilion in Venice, and the idea of pavilions in Venice is is kind of an interesting one. There's a certain number of of buildings that are built as pavilions, but they're built in uh, late 19th century, and and most of them actually in the 20th century, and then all of the countries that have joined after, let's say, 1960, um, or after 1970 or even 1980, are renting spaces in the city, and they might be schools, or they might be storefronts, or they might be um, palazzi, they might be, you know, any type of industrial space. And, you know, for the weeks of the Biennale, they are all uh, pavilions, mm -hmm. and I kind of uh, I thought that was also an interesting sort of reassignment of of purpose and for for building. So I wanted to kind of come up with this Icelandic pavilion, you could say, which is then of course a very fic fictional uh, and uh, un unlikely Icelandic pavilion, you could say. Um, and I found the location for it in an old uh, lavanderia or a, an old laundry of the, um, in close to um, an 18th century palace. And so that's kind of, yeah, I mean, that's like the, that's the beginnings of this work. Well, I think I'd like to ask you, and Daniel, you should jump in and ask any question of Katrin that you want, and I will ask you some questions also, but, um, I kind of wanted to just follow up on that question to bring up something that um, you actually, uh, Daniel, mentioned earlier, which I, I has to do with the way the, that this piece represents sort of a shift to, um, to really looking at a surface, um, or the surface being the work, as opposed to um, you know, an attention to surface in the way that the walls create that architectural space. Um, and I think when you started talking about paneling, and, and that was really the key feature in a lot of ways of these rooms that you were looking at, at um, in the Metz collection, and I think that that is perhaps that turning point when you start to look at surface as object as opposed to, um, you know, skin. Right. <laughs> well, I think Catherine didn't make it easy on herself. Um, mm -hmm. because. Uh, but she did a beautiful work here, and particularly I love the play, as she mentioned, the pavilion in Venice being the place where the different countries show their, their uh, national art. But here she has taken the outline of a sort of pleasure pavilion, which were very, very common in the 18th century in the gardens of many of the country houses mm -hmm. and, and palaces where you could, in England, for instance, you could drink tea, you could have, of course, little um, you know, secret meetings, you could uh, go and find some rest to read and whatever it is. And those pavil pleasure pavilions were often time temples of love. Mm -hmm. They're sometimes called as well. That um, they were oftentimes very beautifully furnished in the inside. And, I'm, and I mean with the materials, with beautiful plasterwork ceilings and sometimes these wonderful floors. Now, having worked with Catherine with the, the Boiserie, the, in, in France you don't find so many stone floors and certainly no concre uh, concrete floors. And this <laughs> is a wonderful twist, I think, in her work as well, that she's chosen a very unusual material 
um, concrete being a very old building material, if we think that the Pantheon, for instance, was built of concrete, and I think it's the largest dome in that material, but it's certainly not a material that was used in the past, as far as I know, um, as a decorative surface. It was a building material, and then it would be hidden. Uh, in this case, it is all exposed, and it looks very much like um, a wonderful stone. And I was asking Katrin, how has this service changed, you know, oh, uh, because of the weather impact, because some of it was outdoors. People have, of course, shuffled over there. Um, has it become more glossy? Has it become matted? Um, and she can say that herself. But it, it is a wonderful um, use, I think, of the material imitating something else. And that is historically, um, is it concrete not being used for, the, for this kind of decorative works, but to use one material to imitate another is actually very much steep in history. And we can name numerous examples where one material would actually be used to imitate something else. There is porcelain that has been decorated to look like lacquer. There is um, furniture that uh, made of wood, but it looks like bamboo. Uh, you name it, there are many, many different types where one material is used to simulate another. I don't think that that was your main idea here, um, but it is actually looking over, um, you know, in the history of the decorative arts, you do find glass painted to look like porphyry and so on, so it's not unusual, but I don't think that that was your main goal here. No, I think, you know, I think the, um, the use of concrete was a sort of a practical one. Um, but uh, it's, it's w the same with the concrete as with many other, um, actually many aspects of this work, that there were things that have happened sort of out of um, decisions that were made for technical reasons, out of chance, uh, that have thankfully, you know, um, turned out to be very sort of generous, I think, for the work. Uh, and, uh, you know, that would be, this would be one instance of that. And I actually, I went on the advice of a, of a, of a sculptor and a technician here in New York who, who uh, introduced me to, to this material, which is a special blend of concrete that is used for casting specifically outdoor sculpture. And uh, one of the things that I realized when I first visited this uh, site to be in Venice was that the building, uh, which uh, was sort of a, uh, the earliest part of the structure of the building is possibly from the 17th or 18th century. So they are now um, used sort of as a re repurposed exhibition space. I feel that uh, uh, somehow in the, that, um, yeah, that there was just a, uh, an interesting, um, the interior of the space uh, was really, because of the condition of the building, whatever was to be exhibited inside the building really had to be able to withstand exterior conditions. So, uh, so in a sense, I could not, if I was to use this building, I realized I could not make work on paper, for example. Mm -hmm. I could not mm -hmm. realize this um, in just any material I wanted, because the first time I visited, uh, it, was, it had rained for a week in Venice, and you know, the floor inside was just about as wet as the floor outside. Mm -hmm. So I figured, okay, that's, this is what I'm, and that informed, um, you know, both the choice of materials and also just the work itself. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to extend, uh, you know, make a piece that kind of treated indoors and outdoors the mm -hmm. same and extend it from indoors to outdoors. As no, well. And that that idea, not necessarily the outdoors, but that interior exterior relationship, was also very important in the project of the Met. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there, of course, uh, the work is, uh, you know, the work is located, you could say, deep inside of the museum, uh, but mm -hmm. it's also, there's also an element of, of interior, exterior, and uh, access, and passing through this, you know, the surface that, 
that we, I also um, worked with very specifically in that work. And you asked earlier about this kind of um, flatness or this, you know, this uh, attention to the surface or the decorative surface. And I think that both the work, uh, both the Boisserie and also uh, this work, they, you know, um, you know, frame this uh, interest of mine very, you know, very clearly. But it's actually something that I've been thinking about since um, since I was in art school in San Francisco and since I was kind of making my uh, trials with painting, mm -hmm. uh, which I then found was not really the um, my medium of choice. <laughs> but uh, um, but I think that there is always um, there is always um, in me an interest in the picture and in picture as uh, as it is sort of inserted into architecture or how the relationship between picture making and pictures in architecture and the nature of uh, so I sometimes say that there are kind of um, aspects of my work that are very much uh, discussing painting in a sense the the you know this uh, you know, a surface that represents uh, either something decorative, that represents an illusional depth, a trompoir, uh, and something, and uh, um, a sculpture that in a sense, or, a, or, a, or a, an object that has a front side and then has a back side that kind of carries the structure that makes the illusion or makes the picture possible. And I think um, that's part of the reason why I am interested in, in decorative surfaces. And, you know, where do you draw the line between the painting and the, you know, as I think is very uh, interesting in, in, for example, the, uh, the Hotel du Capri and also in the, in the Creon room, you know, there is really no separation between the, the painting and the, where there, well, there is and there isn't a separation between the painting and the and the decorative paneling. And that's right. And of course, many of the rooms would have, um, as part of their decoration, painted overdoors or plasterwork overdoors. Um, so you would have that, um, and, and not with the plaster, but with the painted overdoors, you would have that sense of painting that is specifically commissioned to be there as part of that uh, overall interior. What strikes me very much with this work, um, we know that this is not something that came from an historic building, although it reminds me very much of floors that could have existed somewhere in a an, in an, uh, symmetrical pavilion. And that's so nice with this installation, if you compare it with the photographs of how it was installed in Venice and later in, uh, in Iceland as well, that for the first time you can actually really get a sense that it is a symmetrical work and that the motifs do repeat each other to the left and to the right very much as you would uh, expect in, an, in a Baroque uh, interior where there was a strict uh, emphasis on um, symmetry. And certainly what I would immediately imagine is that this pavilion must have had a beautiful central, either a cupola or a beautiful mm -hmm. um, decorative ceiling that would have been reflected in the central part, which almost looks like a, a lovely carpet here, um, with a rosette in the center and those, um, they look a bit like Roman numerals, but they're not, and then those lovely sprays of flowers. So you get a sense that this was taken out of, con uh, out of some architectural context. It has survived mm -hmm. and has now been rescued here in, you know, in Queens. And what is uh, particularly nice about this work is that it's a wonderful play because if you think, we don't have that many historic floors at the Met, you can imagine, because floors are very difficult, certainly <laughs> this kind of of stone or cement floors, they're very heavy and hard to take, uh, once they're installed, to take out without damage. So we don't have that many floors that Catherine could have even studied, but mm -hmm. we do have images and engravings and designs for them. But of course, if we were to have a floor like this, what we would immediately try to, to um, obliviate is the, um, what is here, very much part of the work are sort of the scars or the memories of the previous installations. We would have our conservation staff work on that and tone it down or perhaps 
do something in order to give you the floor as it was originally intended. In this case, of course, we, you can't go there because this is all part of the work. And I think this is a wonderful play of, I think, being familiar with museum practices and what, what uh, you know, our conservation staff at the Met would be asked to do and what is here intentional and in intention um, to, to remind us of the two previous installations. And I think that's a wonderful play of, um, uh, in this work. I, well, that perhaps brings a question for Katrin um, about that kind of architectural memory, because in, um, in much of your work for many years, this, um, this idea about memory and architectural memory, but often of architectural spaces that have some personal significance to you, that it's sort of a, a personal memory of architectural space that often is reflected in the work or gets um, sort of retold often um, as narrative or something in the work. In this case, it seems like um, that memory is not so personal, but it's become, it's actually the piece's memory <laughs> of its own narrative, yeah. which is sort of internalized, like the piece is internalizing its own history, which seems like a, a shift in the way that you're thinking about that. The idea of memory and perhaps the, the, way, the architecture of the work. Yeah, I think um, there was something really, I think, I, I think back to this sort of day trip that I did to the, to the Metropolitan Museum when we were beginning the process of this, uh, you know, of making the, the show that I did there in 2010. And uh, I think what I observed so um, much was, like I said, the work, um, the the display structure and also the people looking at the work. Mm -hmm. And I think at that moment something started to really shift for me. And my interest, you know, um, which, which in many previous works had been so personal, like you said, so mm -hmm. much, you know, using sort of my own personal topography to, um, you know, to, to talk about um, talk about things and uh, and this b both both the Boisides and this work they are much more addressing sort of uh, a cultural memory uh, a collective memory um, and then as you as you point out in this work then there's sort of another sort of overlay of memory which which then again comes to be a specific um, not so much a personal, but you could say sort of a, sp a, a specific memory to this work, because you see in it, uh, you could say that this floor is a place, the place represents something that is uh, out of a collective past, uh, but then you could say that the, the scarring of the work is very specific to is, is, the, is the memory of this specific floor, of this specific work and where it has been in, in the lavanderia at the Palazzo Senopio in, in Dorso Duro in Venice and then in the old customs house which now is the Reykjavik Art Museum in downtown Reykjavik. And I decided um, after, uh, after I had installed the work in Reykjavik, I decided very specifically the question was still open at that point if I was going to let the work continue to kind of be sort of erode or you know come apart by further you know uh, through further installations and I decided and you can't kind of make a decision like that I mean I guess you can in a, in a more programmatic sense but you but I didn't want to make that decision until at that point when I sort of saw what the work had become and then I decided that I would stop the uh, I would stop the sort of cutting up of the work and uh, I would leave uh, the scarring uh, as it is now, as a kind of as a, as a memorial also to these two exhibitions in, in Venice and in Iceland. And I think, you know, that's also poignant because of course the work is made, uh, you know, I'm from Iceland and uh, I'm born there and brought up there and have then worked most of my life in the United States. But, you know, for me to represent Iceland is, uh, you know, is phenomenal, and 
And uh, so in a sense, and there's also sort of a context to making this very lavish floor um, as a pavilion for a country that really has no history of nobility and has no, has no floor that looks anything remotely close to this. If there would be, you wouldn't even see, you know, you wouldn't even see wooden floors that have been painted, as you as you see in some Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. You see wooden floors that have, have this sort of painted, you know, beautiful painted ornate surface. At the time in Iceland, you know, the floors were basically they were just mud. There was <laughs> nothing. People were living in houses that were, you know, mud up to here, and then a little bit of wood with grass on top, you know, uh, above. So. Um, Anyway, so I wanted kind of, you know, that is a special, you know, tribute in the work, obviously, and, you know, can be, you know, can elaborate on that. That's another whole conversation. But I, I wanted to kind of stop the, I wanted the memories, the memory of these two buildings, of the laundry in Venice and of the old uh, customs pack house in, in Iceland to be sort of framed mm -hmm. in this floor. Within it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had the feeling that it also was a little bit surrealistic the way it was installed in both pre or installations because a floor which usually is indoors, protected by walls and ceilings, basically the foundation of any ro um, room or that there it was spilling out into the yard, into the outside and here for the first time it's all enclosed in an, another fantastic building um, but there is so there was a little surrealistic aspect I felt that the floor sort of it couldn't stop flowing and exactly. almost uh, looked to yeah. me can you address that at all or? yeah I mean I think there is a I mean speaking of surrealism I think there is a you know there was a very early um, kind of vision behind this um, where, where this all began and that was a, a dream that I had that I walked into my studio and my studio was had been completely emptied out and in place of all my belongings in the studio was this incredibly beautifully lavish and intricate parquet that had been just laid over the entire floor and that was a dream I had probably sometime in the fall of of, uh, of 2011 and uh, and I think that there is a, yes in very much in a kind of a modernistic surrealistic uh, fashion um, a play with kind of drawing in space in the work of 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 using something that is um, a recognizable architectural section and. Um, and doing something that is, yeah, that is kind of surrealistic and playful um, in how that is sort of um, oddly or it sort of in, inter, um, in, what's the word, um, it's the word I'm looking for, just insert it into, mm -hmm. into the building so that it's both kind of, um, it is within the, sort of syntax of logic, but yet it's not logical, which I think is very surreal, surre like sur that's part of surrealism for me. And, uh, and, uh, and also very formal, which is of course, you know, um, the drawing of the pattern is very much about form and about formalism. And then it's sort of, it's sort of like another layer of, of, of a formal study um, in drawing. In the sense of how but, it's but then, in, in a way, in a great, gay, a great contrast, because you chose very specifically that laundry building, where mm -hmm. they might have had a tiled floor just for practical reasons. Yes. A being Venice, B there will be a lot of water mm -hmm. there, but they certainly would have never had anything as lavish and sumptuous as this mm -hmm. one. And then the customs buildings, for sure, wouldn't mm -hmm. have had anything like that. And I think this is the um, place where trolley cars mm -hmm. were being repaired. Is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm for sure they wouldn't have had anything so <laughs> there's a wonderful contrast i feel here by the um, when, you know the lavishness of the work and the um, the building in which it is uh, displayed for three times now right. it's really mm -hmm. quite wonderful mm -hmm. and i think that everybody can't help but notice that a floor being l almost like levitating off uh, of the floor is actually 
sort of interesting. It almost becomes like a flying carpet, if you will, mm -hmm. a little bit. And that with concrete, I mean, the sheer weight of it, um, in a way, you make very light of it by having it lifted off, mm -hmm. off on uh, from the floor itself. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful study in contrast there, yeah. playful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have, uh, in some previous works, I have also, um, I've always been really drawn to this uh, idea of places that move, you know, p um, a place that you can fold up and take with you, or, uh, and very, you know, early, um, that for me was sort of, also a way to speak about memory of how you, how you carry a place with you, and then uh, for, um, I don't know, at least 10 or 15 years, I've been thinking about a place or a house or, you know, some kind of an architectural representation of a place that is very large and that moves in this way, that mm -hmm. moves across a big ocean. And, um, and often, you know, I have ideas like that and then I forget about them or then they get buried in a, notebook somewhere for you know for 15 years or something like that and then you go back in the notebooks and then you see oh it's the same now I made the work that I thought about 15 years ago forgot completely about mm -hmm. and you know and then you find it you sort of find like the almost the recipe of the work from you know from another time and uh, I mean this this is a um, yeah, this is sort of a, a, an obvious contradiction in, in terms to, uh, we think of floors as, you know, as places, floor is like the, you know, is the, is the stasis, is the non-mobile, you think, you move chairs, you move paintings, you move uh, curtains, but you don't really move floors, and mm -hmm. as you were saying, you know, the floors are not the most prevalent parts of the whole thing of, a, of, a muse, of the museum. Um, and then to kind of do the, the kind of the impossible to, to let the place move first. It's made here in Long Island City, in my studio, which is not far from here. And then take it to Venice, put it down in Venice, have lots of people walk on it and be on it there, and then take it to Iceland and same experience, and then bring it back here. And then it has kind of the, history of all these places in it. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go, let's talk a little bit about, um, about the making of it, because it's, um, you know, it's obviously a very intricate pattern, and then all, so it, and we've mentioned that it was, it's made from concrete, but those individual tiles are actually all um, hand cast. So, um, and there were something like 9,000 tiles required to, um, to make the whole floor. Um, and that, all that work was done in your studio here in Long Island City. And I think that that's sort of, and, and I remember early on when we were, you know, when you knew what you wanted to make and we were talking about how to produce this work, um, you know, there was talk about, you know, you could have, you know, a, you know, there, we're, we're in, you know, the piece is gonna be exhibited in Italy. There are all these masons, we could have it cast there, we could cut it, you could laser cut this piece, you know, because Catherine had done all these drawings, she knew what the pattern looked like, and because there are so many different individual tiles, you know, the efficient thing to do would have been to have them laser cut. Um, and it was, it was clear to me from the beginning that that was not possible <laughs> <laughs> um, for a combination of reasons. But I think that, that the fact that um, you did hand cast the tiles um, with the team, um, but the fact that they were hand cast, I think, is very um, evident in the piece. I think it has a completely different feeling because it was handmade, and that that sort of artisanal quality of the work um, is essential to the way we experience the work. And um, I guess that's something that um, it, it seems to me, because one of the things we wanted to talk about is this distinction between, or, or about the sort of the decorative arts in relationship to. Um, contemporary art, um, and that that's sort of one of the perhaps primary distinctions between fine art and decorative arts and other art forms, and or art is that relationship of the artisan and the value of craftsmanship um, relative to you know 
authorship and the, and what the significance of authorship is um, in terms of the execution of a work of art. Right. Um, and I'd actually be interested in both of you responding to that issue. So, <laughs> shall I go first? <laughs> so, um, well, this this is also something that very much comes back to the to the uh, to the Boisides, uh, because, um, well, for also for sort of series of uh, reasons. Uh, the, the process of the making of that work was, um, um, you know, one phase of it was um, that I would come to the museum about once or twice a week and would have an opportunity to go actually into uh, the rooms and do a very careful survey of, uh, of the patterns and of the moldings and, you know, just being in the presence of being in this, like, intimate presence of, of these uh, old objects without ever touching them, but just sort of always at the, you know, a few inches distance um, is, is something, something really, you know, um, something that had an incredible uh, impact on me, I think, and in the way that I, I didn't really know very much about, let's say, uh, decorative molding, and I was kind of drawing them up and, uh, and you know, studying them in a way maybe like uh, an archaeologist would go on a site um, because I was sort of, um, I was faced with uh, something that I didn't really know very well and I was like learning and studying and understanding it as I was drawing it and imaging it. Mm -hmm. And then I would take this back to my studio and, and again, you know, uh, for, for reasons that c kind of had a lot to do with chance and, you know, some of them were just things that were a little bit out of my, out of my control to be able to uh, guide. Uh, I ended up working um, with, um, originally, um, I was always, uh, I had neighbors who are um, uh, antique restorers and uh, they, you know, they had the studio next to me and I would be in there on a regular basis. Often we would, they would work for me uh, or I would, you know, we would do some sort of exchange of work. And, uh, and I had uh, decided that I would ask them to make the furniture for the, uh, for the Creon room. And just again, being sort of in this uh, vicinity, in this closeness, with you know their practice and their way of of, uh, of working, I think really um, had an influence on me. And then it turned out that um, I ended up being sort of the, the I don't know how to how to phrase this exactly, but I ended up being the person who was sort of called for making for casting the uh, all of the decorative molding myself <laughs> and so i found myself sort of in the role of the of the artisan which i hadn't necessarily sort of thought of to begin with but um but then i was in that role and that really had um that just was turned out to be a very important part of the meaning of the work and it's something that really stayed with me, so that when I started working on this work and as it sort of came to develop, um, I had done all this uh, casting of these decorative moldings and, uh, and I just wanted to continue, um, you know, I wanted to continue that, uh, that way of working. And as you said, Mary, we were, you know, we were, there was a point where we really had to make some really practical decisions about like how this was to get done, you know, you know, this, you know, you have this size, this amount of time and like how to do it, you know, and, uh, and I think we almost decided to go a different route and then it was just like, no, no, we can't, we, we have to do it, we have, it has to be done by hand and, and I'm actually really happy because there is uh, one of the artists who worked with me who is here in the audience, and she should really be applauded <laughs> for the hard work she did with me. <laughs> Hannah Wiegeleisen. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>
And we basically, we cast all of the tiles in, in um, uh, well, Hanna might need to verify this, but I think we, were, we did most of the casting in, in uh, two and a half months. And we sort of, we began, and we did all the molds, and we did, you know, everything, and we worked in this, like, incredibly militaristic, you know, regime of, of you know, of one thing after another. We have to do, make this many prototypes today, this many casts, cast this many tiles, and, you know, it was all, it was like an incredible machine. And, and it was also, I thought it was extremely, um, I loved it. I just, I loved, mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It was really hard work because we, uh, all of the concrete was um, was mixed by hand because the this material is very, um, it's a very, it has a short working time and it's very, very thick and hard. So even if we had used a, 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 an electric concrete mixer, we would have just wasted lots of material that way and. And uh, so it was, in a sense, a very, um, it was an old, uh, old process that we used to do this. It was very much in line with, this is not a, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, there's not, uh, uh, you know, 21st century um, chemistry going on in the way the concrete is mixed, but essentially the pigments are, are oxides. Uh, so they're, you know, it's probably the same way as, as, as uh, you know, as uh, color has been produced in, in these type of materials for a very long time. And, um, and, uh, and the process, the manual, it was a completely manual process, like no, you know, nothing, nothing except just, just the hands to, to, to cast all these tiles. And that sets up a, a, I think, a relationship between that, um, the labor that goes into making this incredibly luxurious um, surface or, or object that is both, you know, in the, from a, a decorative arts perspective, a, you know, a, an object or a, a th something that would have been created for the very wealthy, you know, for the for leisure, it's this contrast between the labor it takes to create something for that level of leisure. <laughs> but I think that Catherine is really unique here in a way that not only did she think of the work, she did all the designs, but she was also actively involved in the creation of it, and that today I think is extremely rare because mm -hmm. so much can be made. And I think with m think of many of the modern designers that we have who dream of wonderful things, but they mm -hmm. don't make any of it themselves. Mm -hmm. so I think this is really quite unique. Mm -hmm. And in a way, maybe not even in the way it was done in, in the 18th century, because then there would be a design that someone else was then asked to, to, to cut the stones to, to, to the size it off and, and to lay it in, because then you had the designer and the actual craftsman, but not always were they the same, the same person. person. So I think here you are in a way it's like a Renaissance person <laughs> uh, inventing the whole thing in yeah, invented and fitchy <laughs> as mm -hmm. they used to sign their works, you know. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that there was certainly for such luxurious um, services there was quite quite a deal of specialization mm -hmm. uh, in the in the past as well. So for Catherine to have done it really to get her hands dirty and think of the ways of you know, making the silicone molds and casting it and, and I think extremely courageous, uh, particularly since it is a new material for you. Mm -hmm. So I think brava. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I need to share that with, uh, with the people who, who actually did this manual work with me because it is true that I did, um, I, I did was of course involved in the you know in the mixing of the concrete and in the casting of the tiles, but you know there um, there was of course uh, there was about I, I'm trying to think if there was about a uh, total of maybe about six of us I think that were that were casting on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but I think also you know. Um, 
you know, on another level, um, obviously, I am, you know, I, I consider myself, um, you know, um, an artist who is, you know, who's not uh, on a regular basis uh, necessarily, you know, start, uh, sort of, you know, my work doesn't necessarily, st as I've been kind of describing, doesn't necessarily start from the point of, of uh, the decorative, but I think um, I'm also, of course, you know, through this uh, real kind of lived experience through these exhibitions that I've done, I'm also in some way examining and, uh, you know, uh, I'm examining, you know, also the role of the artist mm -hmm. and the vocation of the artist mm -hmm. and, you know, and the agency of the artist, which I think comes, uh, you know, is a little bit also what you're talking about and, and where, you know, where where's this, you know, where does the line, uh, you know, in the model of production, where are the lines drawn and, you know, who is doing what and who is designing and who is deciding what is being, what it's all gonna look like and who is doing all the labor and, you know, and so on. And I think that, you know, um, in a sense, you know, this this way of working comes very much from just the way I have been taught to work as an artist. I think, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of out of a, you know, out of a, out of schools and out of a generation where you know this kind of distinction between, you know, somebody who conceives the work and then somebody else goes and fabricates it and makes it is not, um, you know, it's it's always something that I, <laughs> I always like. I always pause a little bit before I sort of go into that, not with any, um, you know, not with any judgment or disrespect to that way of working, but it's not really, it is not what is most natural to me, mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. You think through the material. I and very much do, and I, and I am also, as most know that have, you know, that uh, know, have w worked with me that, you know, I'm very protective of the, of the process and of mm -hmm. even, you know, and I think often of, uh, you know, there are ways in which um, I think people just, it's maybe not anything that is really apparent to anyone, uh, but it's just, it has to do with the act of making and it has to do with the time in the studio and it just has to do with the, um, some way, kind of the ritualistic aspect of, of making art and, you know, the creative time, the time in the studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, well, first, Daniel, I'll ask you if you have other questions you want to ask of Katrin or, or things you want to bring up about the piece. I think we have talked about a lot already. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then in that case, I would open it to the floor to see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm interested in uh, kind of knowing in a very modular world where everything is kind of standardized and, and repeatable, um, if, if, if the sheer manualness of it's like that, that everything is hand cast and hand done uh, is important to you um, and how it can be kind of have used the thing, like even thinking about the substrate, um, it's a very modular kind of construction, um, which are kind of comes apart in a modular, in a modular format, but the, the manual is the piece, and I wonder how you kind of balance the, not, like, the modular versus the manual, and the individual kind of worlds of thinking. Yeah, I mean, the piece is all, it's all modules. It's every, it's modules, it's like modules going regular. through modules, going through modules, it's like, the tiles are modules, the sections that the tiles are on are modules, the, the underneath structure is modules, it's all, you know, a set of, and I, I delight in that because it's so mathematical and, you know, it's just so, you know, lovely in that sense. Um, but like, I think maybe a little bit like what I was kind of addressing in the last question. Um, you know, there is, a, on one hand, you have sort of this, you know, geometry or the mathematics of the modularity. And then on the other hand, you have the kind of structure of production that is related to that. And I think you could say maybe that to the first, I'm just kind of loving it all. And to the second, I'm pausing a little bit and, you know, 
uh, as we as we talked about, you know, it was not, you know, we did not decide to to have this uh, fabricated, you know, by uh, the quickest and the most efficient technology. Let's say we we decided on a different um, mode of production. I think it really shows in the piece. It really shows in the piece. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Um, the pieces I've seen in person, I wanted to ask you about the edges. Because the, you know, the ones I've seen, there's always the beauty of the middle. And then the edges, I always want to ask you um, how you consider this, the edges and the more you know, utilitarian parts of the piece. Even when you did Wasri, I remember the folding screen. I remember yeah. you could see the edges that were yeah. rough. Yeah. And I've never asked you about that. Well, I yes, the edge is really important, actually, very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the edge is sort of where the where these. I mean, this kind of goes a little bit back to what we talked about earlier about paint about the painting, and uh, because this is where these two worlds meet, and the world on top of the piece and underneath the piece are very, you know, they're very different. They're, they're, you know, we have been talking almost entirely about the top, the top of, of the piece, piece, the surface of the piece, and we haven't talked so much about what's underneath. And, you know, these are two, two stories in a sense. We've talked about what's underneath the piece in the sense that we talked about it being, you know, uh, mobile. Um, but, um, so I think, um, the edge in this piece in particular, I think, is also a quotation to several um, works uh, that I've done where I've also been sort of playing with architecture and architecture almost as a metaphor for maybe a more um, natural uh, topography or, or landscape mm -hmm. works that I did about 10 years ago mostly. And uh, works often where you know uh, an architectural form is used to represent, let's say, a boundary on a map or something like that. So you kind of have the sense of an island that is created just out of like um, sort of institutional-looking walls. And I think when we decided to do this like raised uh, baseboard, uh, that just really sort of you know, that reference and that memory really sort of popped, uh, popped uh, up or, and, um, and I think that, you know, I'm always interested in making the edge really show how these two worlds uh, are just two sides of the same and how they conflate and how there's like a kind of a, um, a Maybe in a sense a contradiction, but a contradiction in perception, but not really a contradiction in nature, or how you know how one world enables the other, or you know how they how they come together like that. Well, it, it also seems to go back to me. To me, it goes back to this issue of like the surface and the support. Like there can't be a surface without a support, exactly. <laughs> and there's no support. I mean, Yes. You have something yeah, to, you, you, to support. Yeah, you have nothing. Um, yeah, you need something to support. <laughs> so, um, I, but I think that that. I mean, it, I was thinking about when Danielle was talking earlier. It, I was thinking about when you were talking about pictures and architecture and your interest in um, the image and how, you know, ornamentation and pre like pre modern <laughs> architecture um, and decoration is quite representational. It's usually referencing nature, an organic form, or you know, sort of making the architecture somehow closer or imitating, it's an imitation of other forms that are there, um, whether it's animal or vegetable or <laughs> mineral. Um, and, you know, and then you come into the 20th century and you get this idea about form follows function and so it's all about structure and truth to material and all of those things. And you sort of marry these two things in, in this work where it becomes both about that image and that representation, but also, you know, it's married to this structural form that's quite honestly structure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it gives a hint of architecture here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and with the openings where the former doors might have been or windows or wherever. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, again, it also carries on that, that history of the piece in its former installations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Josie? and I mean this is maybe a question for me to you is is also that um, a lot of uh, a lot of decoration a lot of decorative molding or patterning kind of has exactly that purpose of sort of transporting like of transport to another time another period I mean you see a lot in in 18th century patterning that might be you know, uh, pointing towards the Orient, mm -hmm. or um, you know. Yes, there usually there there can be quite a bit of evocation of other cultures or mm -hmm. former periods. Mm -hmm. Definitely think with the Renaissance or the Neoclassicism, mm -hmm. the going back to those antique uh, forms and motifs, and and you get certain ornaments recycled, if you will, all the time. And I think. You can definitely read that in this uh, work as well, without actually being s a specific copy of anything that ever existed. Mm -hmm. um, she you know, clearly, Catherine has looked at lots of things. She's visited existing floors, um, but she hasn't copied any of them. Mm -hmm. She made it her own, and I think that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think we should wrap up. Thank you very much, Danielle. Thank Katri. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>